It seems like a long time since we've been here, but it could be my imagination. Uh, in any case, how great is it that we're approaching some degree of normalcy finally? Amen. And we're getting back. Uh, I gotta say one thing. Uh, I wish my mother Mary was here. She was my biggest fan. And uh, she always sat in the same place, and Fred Dunn over there always saved her a seat. And I appreciate his kindness. She really liked Fred. Uh, he did that every month, which is really cool. We've had a lot of support from various other organizations over the years. Monroe County History Center, and I'm actually on the board now, so maybe we'll get even more support. Who knows? I don't know. Uh, Monroe County Public Library, which is furnishing the speaker today, yay. Uh, IU Photo Archives and Cats TV. It's great to have them back. We had to film our own stuff a couple of times. Uh, and it worked out okay, but it's not nearly as good as them. And of course, the American Legion and Dick Dunbar, the former commander here, has been one of our biggest, biggest backers. Uh, Dick is going to say something. I'm just waiting for him to get back. He, he had the wrong hat. So he... Dick wears many hats. Well, George, you can go ahead and use your ma usual uh, okay, statement. Mike. Go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. Let him have it. No, you go ahead. Ma this is my Minister of Propaganda, George. And here comes Dick Dunbar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was hoping for a better introduction. That's why I <laughs> Thank you, Mike and George. Appreciate it. Um, as most of you know, this is the first time I've talked to a group with my new title, which is Past Commander now. <laughs> a, lot people, thank you. a lot of people want to make me a plain old member, but with my mouth, I don't think I could ever just be a plain old member, so anyway. <laughs> I do appreciate the History Club. On behalf of the American Legion, welcome back. We're glad to have you folks, believe me. Uh, we missed you. We missed a lot of the groups that have been coming out. We are getting closer and closer to normal. As you can see, the crowd today is pretty good for the first time back, wouldn't you say, Mike? Oh, yeah. But it was my pleasure to be commander here for 10 years. Mike and I and George and a lot of other people worked pretty hard getting this thing off the ground, and I'm proud to be part of that. I think it's gained our membership, and uh, we've really done some good things with the history club, so thank you. But my main goal here today is to give an award for not the history club, but a Legion member. We've been trying to get this done for a while. You find her. <laughs> She's been really hard to pin down. Uh, she still is. We've, uh, we've had a hard time with all of our award presentations because of the uh, the Saturday meetings have been limited, and people trying to get out to them have been limited. But uh, I did want to do this in front of some people, and most people in here know this individual. There you go. Gary, you can come up. Home. <laughs> I tricked her. It's really typical of Carrie to be working when you're trying to do something for her, because she's been a, nothing but a, a great worker here for a long, long time. So, I don't know if everybody knows, but Carrie, she is a veteran. She's an Indiana National Guard veteran, and uh, a lot of people don't know that about her. She's a 16-year member of our American Legion. She's not only an employee here, but she's one of the biggest assets I think we've ever had at this post. Yes. Amen. And we really miss her. But she's moved on with her life a little bit, and uh, her husband Rob and I have been, we tried a couple of times to trick her into getting out of here so we could surprise her. So uh, when I heard she was going to be working today, I thought, well, this would be a pretty good opportunity to get this done in front of some people and some friends. And if you guys have been out here during the day, you've seen how she is when she works. She's, just been, she's been great. But that's not why we're honoring her from the American Legion side. She's been great with our veterans. <laughs> She never forgot why we're here, which is to support veterans. That's what we do, number one. All this other stuff is just fluff, you know, that uh, 
a product of what we do for veterans. That's why we're here as an organization. But anyway, what, Terry, about five years ago? On the near the year? 2015. 2015. Gave her a very high award, legionnaire of the year. And uh, the second highest thing we can do for someone as a member is an honorary life membership. So today, in recognition and sincere appreciation of outstanding loyalty and dedication to this organization, this honor recognizes the commitment demonstrates towards programs, activities, and ideals of the American Legion, dedicated to God and country. Presented by Burton Lord, Post 18, to Terry L. Gouin Lucas. Okay, come on! Along with that certificate in your mail card, but you'll still get a card every year. Uh, Mr. May won't be bugging you to pay your dues anymore, so you'll just get it. And you'll get a life member patch. Oh, yeah. You can put it on your nightgown or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but, and uh, maybe we don't want to know. There is. She's just been a great friend of me, and I miss her so bad out here, but I, I know she's uh, doing better things. And uh, her husband, Rob, he's a Marine, and he's been a great friend, too. Her dad, Mike, I think a lot of people miss her in her dad. And yeah. he's a great Marine and a great veteran. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I do, I work at Catalyst, but I have a weird, weird schedule, and... I miss the hell out of this place, to be quite honest. So I'll probably, you'll try to see me here volunteering occasionally, just on the side, because both my kids are, one's going to college and one's moving away for a job, and I'm going to be left at home with him, so I've got to come somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much, Dick. Love you, love you all, and thank you very much. That's it. Thanks everybody for coming out again. I can tell you from my heart that the American Legion does appreciate you. Our staffing has been a problem. That's one reason we haven't been able to get some of these big groups back. It's getting better day by day, and we hope to uh, be, have larger groups in the future. But today's a great turnout. So, Mike, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. George? I guess I've got a minute to talk here. It's kind of an emotional minute for me for some reason. Mike's not on. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of an emotional moment for me when I think about this. I grew up in this Legion home. The one down on South College Street. My grandfather was uh, one of the family members of this post. My father was a member of the championship uh, American Legion Color Guard. And I used to stay in the American Legion all the time downtown and eventually came out to this place. So the American Legion is very dear in my heart. It was difficult for me to be able to come here today because this time last year I was beginning to wonder if I was ever going to get here again. It is so good to see all of you again. Give yourself a hand. <laughs> Mike calls me his minister of propaganda. Well, I guess that means I get to talk a lot. <laughs> I need to thank some people here. First of all, of course, we thank the Legion for being here. And I thank Cats TV for coming here. I always do. And incidentally, you guys are supposed to be coming to do a presentation, but you keep sliding out from under us. <laughs> you know. But we, we want you here. Cats is important to this community because they record us remembering history of this community. You have, you have any idea how rare what, we, what we're doing here is? How many other communities can you think of that have a free presentation to talk about the history of how we grew up in? I appreciate it very much. I thank all of you for coming. If I've forgotten anything, then I'm old. So, George, you usually mention the emails. I usually mention the emails. Thanks, Mike. I think my mic is dying again. Okay, there it is. You've got to almost eat this stuff. If you're not on our email distribution list and would like to be, please see me at the end of the meeting, and I will put you on that list. And I'll be glad, glad, glad to take care of it. But not all at once now, and take your time because I'm slow. And uh, we'll, we'll get you on the list. 
Thank you so much for being here today. It's good to see all of you again. Thank you. Thanks, George. Is that coming across? <laughs> uh, as for our uh, next meetings, we're, we're scheduled till the end of the year, just about. Uh, there were a lot of people, a lot of people waiting in line. Uh, first of all, next July 27th, Sandy Lynch is going to do a history of RCA. Now we've done that a couple of times, but this one's a little bit different. Uh, she and uh, Gib Apple wrote a book, and they're going to be here uh, for sale. I think they're $16, something like that, but uh, it's not that expensive. So we're looking forward to another RCA presentation. And what she would like is, is as many people that worked at RCA or had family that worked at RCA uh, come here and, and you know, maybe contribute some thoughts to the past, their, their past at RCA. Uh, August 31st, John Jake Butler, who's given a couple for us before, will do something called On the Way, a history of transportation in Monroe County. And uh, Butler is really good. He's so uh, concise and does so much homework to get this stuff done. September 28th, Richard Koenig has a lot of old photos that he took when he was on campus here in the 70s and 80s. A lot of black and white images from the railroad, uh, Monon and other, other things like that, part of the town. Uh, October 26th, Derek Ritchie will return. He's given quite a few. He's going to talk about the Laberto Mansion and the Hunter Mansion, which a lot of you may not have heard of. They were up on, what, 11th in college, George? 11th in Walnut? Yes. Yeah, anyway. Uh, 11th in Walnut. He's going to tell the history of those two places and why they're no longer here. There was a Hunter was 11th in Walnut. Laberto was 11th in college. Oh, okay. And then uh, November 30th, Jeremy Boshears is going to come back and give another presentation on the covered bridges of Monroe County. Uh, Jeremy, again, did one about that before, but he said he's found out so much information that uh, he could easily do another one. So that's what he's going to do. Uh, oh, yeah, a couple of announcements about the History Center. Uh, the new exhibit, new exhibit, Monroe, a county of cultures, is open until January with an opening reception Friday, July 9th from 5.30 to 7. Uh, Saturday, July 17th is Black Authors Speak Book Fair at the History Center from 5 to 7 p.m. And, uh, yeah, they mentioned the book, which is $16.05 that Sandy Lynch will be selling next month. Okay, that brings us to today. Christine Friesel, who's given, I bet, five or six of these things. She's going to talk about the Depression as it relates to Monroe County, uh, some oral histories of that and other things. So, Christine. Thank you. It's good to see everyone. Um, I sound good, cats? Thank you. Um, a couple things about the Monroe County Public Library and the Indiana Room. Um, we, the Indiana Room is back open again. We're, we're happy to report that. Um, if you are doing genealogy, Ancestry.com has allowed us to give home access to this database um, until the end of the year, so that's exciting. A lot of people during this lockdown um, got excited about genealogy, and so um, we are actually pretty busy with people who are coming back to in, in Indiana Room, but people are just emailing me to just look things up. And so I know you guys have been busy with genealogy. Um, the library has, uh, um, I've just, just um, brought in some, some old posters from an old project. We're cleaning out a closet and it's limestone month. And so if anyone loves limestone and loves limestone photos, I just have some of these old posters I wanted to show because it is still technically limestone month. Um, but for those of you who know the Monroe County timeline, this was a bicentennial project where we wanted to put an event on a timeline and have a source citation so that we could point to whether or not this was true or really happened. But in that project, um, when that project was coming to an end, I actually wanted to see um, where things happened. And then I sort of 
slid off into a ditch and actually said, what if we don't really know if it really happened? What if we don't have a source citation? What if the only source that we have is the liar's bench? Or so-and-so said so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. Could we do anything with oral history? Um, and so we are starting to play with another project called Monroe County Field Notes. And that is a way for us to research your parcel history going back to the 19th century and just sort of look at who owns that property and if there's any oral history tied to that property. So um, I do encourage you to check out the Monroe County Field Notes project and I have some flyers here. Um, so oral histories um, and mapping oral histories and, and, and when you are at an intersection around downtown or even out in the country, if you say, what happened here? And a lot of times, if the um, people were hardworking people, they didn't have the luxury of writing it down. They may not have even had the luxury of being literate. Um, and so, um, but we wanted to know, certainly people who have lived here in Monroe County a long time have these oral histories. And we typically, academically, we say, what is your source citation? And so the Monroe County Field Notes, and even this project itself, we just wanted to play with the idea of what if we don't have a source? The story still rings true. I have a side of the family that's just a brick wall. And the one thing that we know from that was that so-and-so was thrown out a window. <laughs> and you know, there's no documentation for that, but it is interesting and it's compelling. So um, we're, gonna, we're gonna hang on to that one piece of information um, and maybe pass it down and maybe somebody will solve the mystery of that, and actually I did, but anyway, that, that one little story, I don't have the date, but I, I think I've got it connected. So these stories um, may be unreliable narrators that I'm presenting. Um, somebody might say, oh, the Great Depression, Bloomington, oh, it was fine, we didn't suffer at all. And then the next oral history would be, oh my gosh, it was the worst thing that ever happened to us. But you know from your own family stories, somebody will say, oh, we walked four miles in the snow to get to school every day, even in the summer, and yeah. you know how it goes. So let's begin. I have to warn you, this session is gonna be a little long, um, and I was told that it was okay. I'm a little surprised by that. Okay. Um, we're gonna first, start off with some image credits. Um, these presentations that the History um, Club does often relies on the photos collection at the Indiana University um, Ar Photo Archives and the um, History Center. And I just want to do a huge shout out for those people who do make these images publicly available. What we're looking at now is actually from the Library of Congress. This is 1941, Monroe County. and. Um, Mike, if you want, I can send you the link to this, and you can put it on your Facebook to see if we can figure out where this was. Okay. Um, but I wanted to use this image to just point out that um, these oral histories, the general consensus seems to be that Monroe County did pretty good, and that if, if your family was attached to a farm or a garden, you did okay. So it was those big cities that really suffered that didn't have an option to plant something um, or to be creative in their space or to bring in family. If you had a really tight apartment in a big city, you seemed to really struggle. Um, but we had some rural you know, qualities about Monroe County at the time. So I wanted to see about Monroe County during the Great Depression, so I turned to an oral history collection that was um, created in the 70s and 80s um, by some volunteers at the, the public library. But I am gonna start in the middle of things. We all know that October uh, 1929 is when the, um, that black day when the stock market fell. But this image was created for the 1933 World Fair in Chicago. So we're actually going to start in Chicago. And I, I just want to put your mind back in time to what was going on in 1933. Um, I think our country and our town and our counties had had enough of this thing called prohibition. And some chaos, a lot of crime and frustration with the law. Um, but I think this image does point out um, there was a lot of directions um, in 1933. 
But just to go back in time, in 1929, um, there were 26 manufacturers in the city of Bloomington, and they employed 2,190 people. And then that Black Tuesday happened in October, and, and by 10 years later, there were actually more manufacturers in Bloomington, 30, but only 1,444 were working for manufacturing, so that's about a 60% drop. Um, in 1939, so this is 10 years after the market crash, um, City of Bloomington issues building permits for the first time, and so that makes me wonder if people were getting very creative about housing. In 1939, there are 13 stone quarries and 18 mills in the county um, employing this, this figure I have to challenge, but it says it employs just one, 500 people. By 1948, it was up to 1,420, but still that was only 50 or 60 percent of what it was in 1925 or 1926. 1940, of course, we're on our way out. Um, RCA opens, and the housing and rental con um, demand is very high near, of course, near RCA. And in 1942, the city is completing its first zoning ordinance. Um, the way that this report is written is that the city did not discourage um, growth or development. They really understood that people needed places to live near the RCA plant. So that's just an overview of, of the city and um, what people's feelings were. In um, just a quick note about limestone, I'm not gonna talk a lot about limestone, but I know people are, are going to be saying, looking to the biggest employers, the limestone, IU, and showers. But um, just a quick note about limestone. In 1928, on the courthouse square, that's when the Alexander Memorial went up. And if it had been, um, after the Great Depression or after Black Tuesday, it probably would have never been installed. Um, this was Alexander's um, will that he gave money to have that memorial erected. That was in June. Of course, the stock market crashes in October. And then in the 1930s, especially the early 1930s, our community, our county, and our limestone workers were winning contracts to build um, major buildings. Uh, the West Virginia State Capitol, several federal buildings in Washington, D.C. Our town had great lobbyists working with the limestone industry, so we were winning some contracts to build um, um, prominent buildings in Washington, D.C. I think this was at the time when we got the contract to build the Smithsonian post offices, and the IU Union building was um, underway, so we were very excited in the early 1930s. So, we were kind of late to feel the pain of the um, stock market crash. In 1931, um, the Empire State Building was being completed. But if we're looking at a map of Bloomington, and we're trying to get our bearings straight about where these stories are coming from, <coughs> our first stop is um, uh, with Guy Bar Burnett. In 1929, he is, uh, running, uh, or he is running the Showers Brothers factory and in 1929, the Showers Brothers Company is earning over $2 million, and this would be the company's best year ever. So 1929, things are really, really high for um, Guy and the employees. But we know what happened um, for Guy and his people from his oral history. He started actually um, with the Showers Brothers factory in the traffic department. He was managing the inventory and getting the lumber in and the furniture out. Uh, he knew the, the fronts and the backs and the middles of the Showers Brothers factory. He eventually worked his way up the ladder and during the Great Depression he was running the show, um, especially because one of the Showers Brothers family members was in poor health. According to the late writer and historian Carol Krauss, um, in her story, in her book about the showers, um, about that time, um, October 1929, the stock market crash, people in Bloomington just were, went on their, their business as regular, but there were two events that she writes about that really sort of made us pause. In Indianapolis, a banker leaped from his 11th floor office um, 
And in New Harmony, the president of the First National Bank shot himself. And these were sensational events that got on our front pages. Um, and so people were looking to Showers Brother, like, what is going on? And they started to hear about shrinking orders, reduced traffic, reduced payroll, reduced workers, wages. And the younger workers were starting to migrate out to bigger cities. Um, I'm told that the, or I, I, I remember talking to Carol about this when she was writing the book. She believes that the black workers, who were very welcome at the Showers Brothers Furniture Factory, started to see the signs and were actually prompted to leave Bloomington around this time to go to the bigger cities. Showers had a very bright and vibrant years in the 19, early 1900s and 1920s. Between 1920 and 1930s, there really weren't a lot of major changes for the plants. They didn't keep their um, place modernized, um, and Carol writes, so by the time the Depression hit, employees um, were sort of uneducated, older, the facilities were sort of run down and poor, um, conditions were dim. It was sort of like a sweatshop. It really wasn't very um, high-tech or exciting. Workers, the quote is, workers habitually spat tobacco juice on the floors and the toilets were not kept clean. So if you were a young worker trying to be excited about your future, showers by the time the depression hit was really um, not that glamorous. Um, it just could not survive the depression in that state. So it was a prime, um, it was very ripe to be neglected, and then the depression hit. Of course, we know that RCA is coming to town in 1940, and so the young workers would want to work for a, for a more modern facility. Here's what guys said about showers. They really did make a, a hell of a lot of money in 1929. We got a lot of business in 1929, but from then on, brother, it was tough. Starting in 1930, when everything just, just got more and more worse, all of those depression years, Christ, we were losing money more than ever, and we lost a lot of money before that, but we were able to recover. We finally got our feet again in 1938 with the help of the First National Bank of Chicago, and we made money ever since. And just to get a sense of where Guy is living, he's living in North, 615 North Walnut Street um, with his wife Mary, and he's got two kids, Guy Jr. and a girl Elizabeth. In 1940, um, he's still at the place. You can see that he's walking. He's able to walk to Showers Brothers. So as you're driving north on Walnut, just keep him in mind. Um, his son Guy was um, uh, working at the local book. He had a bookstore that was um, across the street from the alley bar where the Chase Bank is now. So I think that's where the bookstore was. Um, Guy said he never saw a bread line in Bloomington. It just didn't happen. He retired in 1952, um, but it was the worst year up to that point. Then the company was hemorrhaging money, and by 1954, it was worse, and it was his final year. So Guy tried to, to, to pull it through. Um, I was really impressed with this oral history, and I really became attached to Guy, but just, uh, just a few days ago, I was looking up just the run-of-the-mill obituary, and I ran across this article in 1940 that Guy's son was arrested for federal crimes. Started in, um, they started investigating him in the late 30s. Um, he was doing something with federal money or mail fraud. Um, but it strikes me that in Guy's oral history about all the Great Depression, <laughs> what was going on, of course, he doesn't mention the fact that his son was arrested by the, fed by the feds. I'm sure Guy really appreciated the stress in his household during the time. Um, imagine he's trying to hold it together at showers and his son gets arrested by the feds. Um, his son does um, somehow manage to get out, or to, maybe he wasn't guilty at all. Um, this was during the strike at showers that he was arrested. <laughs> so imagine the stress level for Guy. Um, but his son ended up serving in World War II, so I wondered if there was a deal made that, that if he would serve in the war, he might um, um, remove his record. Our next stop is with Will Purcell. Um, he is on Fairview. And we know what happened in the Great Depression for the oral history of Will. Um, he was born in 1896, but in 1933, when he was about 37 years old, he came to Bloomington from Sullivan. 
Um, he had a large family, um, but he took off for Sullivan, or from Sullivan to Bloomington. According to the um, census, he had an eighth grade education. And this is, uh, you can see where he is living. The red dot is where he is living. And he is working for the Eiffel family. The question is, um, on the oral history, um, tell us about the um, working for Mr. Fell, the iron and junk place. Yeah, I did right, the old guy. I was, it was a very hard time. We just take any, we just take anything. We just had to hunt for work where we could find it and take what we could get because like at that time, you couldn't hardly find anything to do and it was just lucky to have anything. Lots of times you get up and you didn't know where your meal was gonna come from. I've seen some pretty rough times and the question is, did people on the farm have it easier? Well, I, I would. I wouldn't say that we had it easier. Now, I, I don't know. Some of them worked in factories and they had different bosses in town and some of them had pretty good jobs. Maybe they had better living than someone on the farm. But the farmer, he could raise his own wheat. He could, ha he could have it milled. He could have flour. He could have cornmeal. He could have meat. He could have his own lard, his own milk, his own butter, his eggs, his chickens which sounds pretty good, we'd always have something to eat, but no luxuries. And of course, my own mother used to take her milk and butter to the town on Saturdays, and she had her regular customers. This is his house at 328 South Fairview. Uh, so soon after he arrives, um, he is found here on the census, or the city director living with his wife, Inez. Um, so the question is, how about many years how many years have you lived in this house? And he says, I came to town in 1933 without a penny in my pocket. I came here the next day after my daddy had passed away and was buried, that he was buried on a Wednesday. And I came to Bloomington on a Thursday. I hitchhiked over here, didn't have a dime in my pocket. I couldn't have a cup of coffee. So what did you do? I helped them tear iron apart, cut it, cut it up. We had what they call a pair of shears then, and I helped them on the shears. I worked on one end, and the other guy worked on the other end. We put it in there and cut it up like scissors, you know. We just cut it up into lengths, and we get it ready to ship out. Then we tear up the automobiles. Then we take them all apart. Then we take parts off and save them for the other parts. And the same way of stoves and stuff like that. So Purcell was working for um, Mr. Fell at Fourth and Rogers. Um, when he had the iron and junk place there in Bloomington. And when he was asked what he thought about going through these hard years and you know how these sufferings will make you stronger, he said it's hard to convince people now that, they, that we had it harder back then. Um, they just don't realize uh, what it's like to have poverty. Um, he later pulled himself out of the junk business and went into selling furniture, new and used. And uh, he went on into the moving and storage business in 1940, city director, he's owning um, Purcell's furniture store, new and used, on at 925 and nine, um, 935 and 937 West Second Street, where the old I Center used to be. Um, in 1955, he owns Pete and Purcell's transfer and storage, which becomes a U-Haul movers. So he came out of the Great Depression and did okay. You can see where the Duke Energy is, and the red dot is where his furniture store. Um, was it by the 1940s? So, uh, in in doing the the iron um, um, recycling or junkyard work, he actually learned how to, the logistics of moving and storage and and all of that business. So, and then uh, in 1955, you, you'd see his um, storage place on West uh, North Summit. Our next stop is Wilma Brinegar. Does anyone show hands know her? Remember her? Oh, well done. I hope I do her justice. Um, so she grew up where the hospital is now, um, on um, West 2nd Street. And we know about what happened in the Great Depression from the oral history of Wilma. This is her 1953 uh, photo in the Gothic. I believe her nickname at, um, later in life was Lady on the Square because she had worked so many businesses, uh, retail establishments, um, in the theaters, all in the square. But I think she's also called Mimi. So how did your family um, 
do, do well with the home garden. And she said it served five of us, my mother and father and three children. Oh yes, we depended on um, that a great deal during the depression. Of course, my sister, she's six years younger than I am. We were just children and I remember that um, if we hadn't had that garden. Her father um, was called, his nickname was called Wiss, W-H-I-S, but his first name is Luther. Um, and he was in the limestone business. Uh, Wilma goes on, we had at that period of time when my father was, was not working, he was engaged in the limestone business and of course when the depression hit in 1929 and 1930, the bottom just dropped out as well as many other businesses. I think I was three years old in that time when my dad didn't have a job, or oh, it was three years during, um, her father was out of a job for three years she thinks. So it was a very difficult time for us and they, um, they got, they, they got along and we paid our bills as we could or when we could. Um, back then, she says, it was just slow paced and I think people took time to really enjoy life more. Of course, she was a young, very young during the depression, so as a child, she probably enjoyed having her father around the house to play with. I think maybe today we are a little too intent, we've become a materialistic society. We're a little too intent on materialistic things rather than enjoying just the beauties of nature, the blue sky, the flowers as you walk along. So you know that um, Wilma uh, lived on West 2nd Street. This is where the hospital is, of course. And she goes on to say, I just love to get out and work on the garden and work on dirt. So this time was a real struggle for her family, but it planted a seed for Wilma to love gardening because they had so much to rely on the garden. So she, she just says she just loved working with her dad and she has great fond memories of nature. So um, while it was a bad thing for her parents in Wilma, it was a wonderful memory. Um, and so she goes on to talk about all the cans of fruits and vegetables and jellies and jams um, that her mother made. Um, so her mother was serious um, home economics queen. I guess maybe most of everybody was back then. Um, Wilma went, later went on to work for um, Indiana Theater and many of the stores on the Courthouse Square. Our next stop is, we're going actually back to Fourth and Rogers, um, to the Eiffel Building. Um, and now we're going to be listening to what Irving Fell has to say about the Great Depression. Here's a photo of him from 1929. He graduated right before the stock market crashed, and his father um, was building the Eiffel building at Fourth and Rogers. Irving's family was Jewish, um, very few Jews in Bloomington at this time. So the family traveled to Chicago for any of their major holidays or celebrations so they could be with their community. He was actually a serious violinist and even a drummer for the IU marching band. And he, when he was in the Chicago, he met his wife, Rose, who was a violin prodigy. And she became a big part of the music scene when they, they settled in Bloomington. And their children also were serious musicians. Uh, one of the, their daughter was a harpist. I don't know if anyone remembers this, but they're very well um, refined musicians. But um, anyway, his experience, um, you see the red dot here is where the Eiffel building is. But they also later owned the Hoosier Workwear Outlet building, um, which is behind Rainbow Bakery. Um, so they um, established the the Army military surplus store there. So according to Fell, Bloomington was not hit very hard. As a city, they were not hit very hard because of the diversification of business and IU saved the town from disaster. The small town economy, the little gardens, and the people were able to feed themselves. The banks were not hurt very much because they were risk adverse to begin with. And they did little investing here in this region. And he says, I don't know of any store that went out of business and no banks went out, not even a factory. Those in the limestone industry also ran farms and they made good money in limestone. The scrap business suffered, I would say, quite a bit due to the prices. The prices of iron and copper nosedived real low because it affected the steel mills. It just wasn't expanding 
People were scared. They didn't know what to do. In fact, we had about 16 tons of copper, which was the most copper we ever accumulated. And we'd write to the refineries in Gary and Chicago and St. Louis, and we'd say, what are your prices now? What can you afford? And they would write back, we just don't have any money. If you want to ship it to us, we'll try to find some space. But my dad wasn't about to ship stuff away at the cost of freight and then not even get a cent for it. At one time, we were, it was down to three cents a pound. The 23 men working for us were let go, and we couldn't pay anything for scrap. Our own resources were down. We had to cut practically down to my dad and myself and let all the 23 men um, go. They said they would even, they wanted to work for even a dollar a day, but we didn't even have a dollar. We couldn't, we didn't even pay taxes for three years and things were bad. Um, they, they, the government or the bank, they wanted to take the building away from us. And dad says, here are the keys, you can come and get it. They says, uh, we have too many. <laughs> we were just trying to frighten you into something. We've got the banks on our backs. So the, um, the, the iron and metal um, business uh, came out okay. You can see that they expanded to a uh, facility that's uh, north, <laughs> northwest of the showers um, near the B-Line. And that um, later, it's at 503 North Rogers, and that is the Fell and Iron Metal was founded by Irving Fell, but it later was sold in 1996. And now it's Bloomington Iron and Metal. So that started and survived the Great Depression. Our next stop is Gerald Ground, and he grew up on 7th Street. We know about the Great Depression, not from the oral history that he left us, but um, from his military record and, and some um, praise from his descendants. I, I ran into Gerald um, when I was doing a house history, and I was just attacked, attached to him. This is his house that he grew up in during the Depression. And we all know that little houses can produce great men, and so it was in this case. Gerald Ground, um, this is 809 West 7th Street. He was from a military family. His ancestors served in the Civil War and World War I. And his ancestors actually were from North Carolina and established here as uh, preachers. So. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if they were some of the Presbyterian Covenanters who were friendly to the early African Americans. Mm -hmm. um, you just kind of make that assumption if you're an early resident of Monroe County and a Covenanter. Anyway, he went on to join Company B of the Parachute Inventory in World War II and became a prisoner of war, um, part of the 82nd Airborne. He was held in the Stalag work camp in Bavaria and Munich. And it, I, I'm wondering if that's what the Hogan's Hero show is based on. Um, I don't think he had that great of a time, though. Um, but because uh, I'm at the American Legion, and of course I wanted to uh, show, uh, show his story, he, um, he made it out okay. Uh, but this is where he grew up, close to Fairview Elementary School. And um, just a toast to all of our vets. A photo of him. This is all I could get. And the reason I ran into um, to know his story was that his grandson, I think, or his son, was later the manager, the road manager for the Oak Ridge Boys. <laughs> so um, somehow he was talking about his his um, great dad. So I'm like, I'm so glad he did because now I was able to connect the dots to that house. So the owner was very delighted to learn that that this boy, who was so heroic, grew up in that house. Our next stop is the Wiles Drugstore, and we know about the Great Depression um, from the oral history of Robert Wiles. He was born in Bloomington and a World War I veteran, and he was president of the drugstore. This is where the used bookstore is across from the courthouse, and he said that farmland around Bloomington was never premium price. Banks um, did, did very few farm loans so because of that, we did okay during the Great Depression. Um, so basically, bad farmland and good limestone um, helped us survive the Great Depression. 
Another stop along the way is the public library. This is, of course, the Monroe County History Center now. But I wanted you to put your mind into the, um, what the librarians were going through during the Great Depression. This is a photo on the left of Bertha Ashby. She's the librarian and the director during this time. And I was so happy to find a picture of her surrounded by children because they were so annoying to her <laughs> during the Great Depression. Um, they, uh, she really struggled with um, the, the chaos and the high traffic. You would imagine that a public library that's offering free entertainment would be um, a high demand for people to get um, a restroom or to get some warmth in the winter or to get some entertainment or to drop off your kids if you didn't have daycare. And so um, in May of 1931, the custodian was, giving police, was given police power. The library makes public a ruling that to give the custodian, Frank Reardon, police power to deal with the disturbances and thievery at the public library. Um, they were really struggling with this, and even the mayor agreed and allowed the library board to do this because of the loafing on the steps, the misconduct disturbance of the children <laughs> running unaccompanied. And so this is in the 1930s is when they said, we need our summer reading program to sort of organize these children. But Bertha Ashby was really concerned that the, the men needed to come into the library to retrain themselves to find a job, and they couldn't focus because all the kids were running around. Uh, but tax revenues were cut by 41%. The bookmobile services was um, greatly cut, no summers. But the traffic at the public library continued to come up um, to increase. Um, some people were coming in to just read a good novel and escape, but um, things were turning up, uh, looking up in 1937, uh, 1936 and 1937. Um, and it was that, ta that time when they dreamed of a branch at the Ellisville Library, but they didn't get one until 1968. Um, but they really did feel the, the cuts deeply at the public library. Herman B. Wells, we're really not going to spend a lot of time on IU campus, but I just want to briefly mention, for those who don't know this, Herman B. Wells um, was the dean of sc the School of Business in 1936, and his field of expertise was economics. So he played a major role in getting Indiana out of the Depression through um, innovative banking regulations. And this crisis helped shape him as a strong leader and gave him an opportunity to shine. Um, and his connections with the government at the state level and the academic level really helped Bloomington get access to those federal relief dollars. Of course, his good friend was um, Paul McNutt, who was the governor. And in one of these um, compartments in your mind, um, just keep in mind that what Herman was thinking about in the late 1930s when he decided that he really wanted to bring more Jewish scholars um, from Europe to Bloomington, and he really opened up an opportunity for people to get out of Europe, the Jewish people to get out of Europe. So Paul McNutt, um, our next stop is actually in Indy, because he's going back and forth, of course, in his car and on the rail, and um, we, I think we did okay during the Great Depression because of our connection to McNutt. Uh, he was um, a World War II veteran, and of course affiliated with this, um, the American Legion. And he um, later put some Bloomington people in charge of distributing uh, federal funding, including um, Professor Lockridge, giving him a job at the WPA to help get us back to work. This is uh, McNutt's house on East uh, 8th Street. He was living here in 1930. Uh, Lily is, um, has so many names that I just only have space for just her first name here, but I hope everyone knows Lily at the end of this. Our next stop is on South Rogers, and we know about the Great Depression um, from Lily's story. Uh, she, um, she is a descendant of the Wright family. Uh, so this is the Ketchum Wright family in Clear Creek, um, our governor um, and a prominent family in Monroe County. So she wrote her genealogy, her fam the Wright family genealogy, in 1943. So you can think that the war is going on, there's not much else going on, as she's typing uh, this um, history of the Wright family. But um, it, it was a way to, it was, she was thinking about this long before it actually was published in 1943. So she had been thinking this 
This has been on her mind during the Depression. She says, I was born near the home of my great-grandfather, James Wright, an early settler of Monroe County, one of our founding fathers, an early librarian. And she, um, she writes, and I was absorbed, I absorbed many family traditions at an early age. I do remember my great-grandfather Wright's funeral, although I was quite a small child at the time. Perhaps the incident of my sister nearly falling into the grave impressed it upon my memory more than the ceremony itself. I became seriously interested in learning more about my ancestors when I returned to uh, our home in Bloomington in 1906 after an absence of eight years. By the time I moved back to Bloomington in 1930, I had collected, so this is after the Depression, an event happened, um, or in 1930, after the stock market crash, um, it triggered her to return back home. I had collected much data and decided to put it in a genealogy of the, um, the right family. Um, what she won't explain here is that in March of 1934, she was granted a divorce, her second divorce, um, from uh, Mr. White. And she was granted custody of her nine-year-old adopted son. Only the boy was not her son, but the gran her grandson, as the mother had taken off her career and couldn't allow um, the unwed circumstances to hurt her chances. And so no one told the boy that he was really not Lily's son, but Lily Lily's grandson. It turned out very well for the boy, and in this circum circumstance gave Lily a uh, tremendous joy and purpose. And so as she was going through the depression, and a divorce, she had to take care of this little boy, who I'm told would go around South Rogers and collect rent money for Lily because she ended up becoming a landlord in one of the houses was a brothel. But the boy didn't know that, um, but he became very resourceful and helped uh, Lily make some money or make some scratch. Uh, you won't hear from um, Lily's uh, history of the Wright family and how prominent they were, that she had only a third grade education, that her mother shot herself in the creek, and that she survived breast cancer and ear cancer, um, and having um, been shamed by being dumped for, um, by her husband for a, a younger girl right during the Depression. Um, but after you some, spend some time with her, you'll recognize her high intelligence, her resourcefulness, her creativity. Um, she was attached to the Bloomington uh, Daughters of the American Revolution, but she also started a chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution when she was in Ohio. And in that um, effort, she was able to meet the, shake hands with the first lady who was in town visiting. So this is a third grade educated woman, but she became very, very resourceful and very creative. And um, she wouldn't talk about the dark parts, but she just kept going. And this is her house on South Rogers. And you might have recognized the Wright family. Um, maybe you're a, the descendant of them. They grew, she grew up near the Ketchum Farm in Clear Creek. Our last stop is on Cottage Grove with um, oh. Ro Robert Cooper. And um, I promised that this wouldn't be um, depressing. <laughs> I hope it's not so depressing. I'm inspired by these people who just get through. I mean, some of us have trouble making our beds and just putting our shoes on and going. Um, but these people just, just survive by grit and creativity. And um, so I was really entertained by Robert Cooper. We know about the Great Depression for his oral history. Um, this is his house at 824 South Cot or East Cottage Grove. Um, in this 1930 census, his dad was working for the city. He was the clerk of the city. So um, I need you to keep that in mind. In 1930, his dad was working for the city, and Robert was working um, as a clerk for the electric company. In 1929, um, he's living here. Um, he wants to talk about showers. He says, nobody was buying furniture during the Great Depression. The Showers family did a ton for Bloomington. They have never been given credit. Of course, this was way before Carol Krauss wrote that wonderful history. I don't know for all the unselfish things that they did, and that's a history that needs to be written someday. Uh, he goes on, the showers built sidewalks. They donated grounds for several of our schools, which few people gave them credit for, but most of um, their employees um, that's, 
they, they employed so many people, and the labor turnover was relatively small, the Showers brothers, because they were, um, they were not oppressive to work for. Of course, everybody worked long hours back then, but the, furniture, the failure of the factory to keep pace with the times and to modernize. Here, the dramatic leaders, just the dynamic um, leadership of the Showers brothers just died off. And then he says, the unions entered in and practically destroyed. I, I cut him off at that point. <coughs> and he says, what kind of jobs were you able to get during the Depression? And he says, the WPA. He says, that started out a very good program, but they prostituted it and made a political football out of it. And if you needed some work, it was public work. You had to go to the Democratic County Chairman to get a job. And supposedly, the district chairman would OK you to eventually, and that is when you got a job. There were very few Republicans who worked on the WPA, government work, and it was like that everywhere. I was fortunate enough to, I didn't have to. My father was a city clerk at the time, and we were fortunate enough to have income that we did. Our grocery bill was astronomical. Sometimes it went as high as $3 a week. <laughs> this is, um, Robert Cooper in The Gothic in 1918. Cooper was a self-employed and independent man. He became independent, I think, because of the Depression. And here's what he said. During the Depression, if you didn't have anything to eat, they'd buy firecrackers and whiskey. And so he said, I think there's a business in this. Again, remember, this is the, the Prohibition period, and his father is working for the city as a clerk. Two things they would, they would buy, firecrackers and whiskey. You know, there was a lot of um, good that came out of the, the Depression. Before the Depression, literally, there was, there was, you couldn't really say there was any sort of middle class or middle income families. It was all either rich or poor. And the Depression sort of brought people together. Everyone was suffering alike, both rich and poor. And of course, I think there were a lot of people the sociologists will agree with that. And from my own observations, experiencing and rubbing shoulders with the masses all my life, I think that that is very true. And these people who were working on WPA, some of them got jobs. Everybody put in a garden and raised what they could. And there was a sense of sharing with one another and, and another thing. Even though the communists were trying hard to make their inroads, I think the reason they failed at the time was the sense of humor of the American people. They never lost their sense of humor. They didn't, uh, make, any dif didn't make any difference how destitute they were. They still had a good time. Bloomington itself fared better than most towns because the university payroll contributed so much to the economy. Showers Brothers kept going, but at a very slow pace. The stone industry was dead as a hammer, and it wasn't until 1937 when we began um, when we were going to um, war, I don't know why he picks 1937, um, that we began to stockpile strategic materials. Maybe that's what he's saying. And things began to open up a bit. So he is saying that um, he is into explosives, um, and he's talking about a sense of humor. I'm, I'm seeing a little immature kid here saying, um, the Depression is pretty sad but I know how to make things pop, right? Um, so that was his source of income, dynamite. Yes. And when his um, oral history was recorded, he said proudly, I have the only manufacturer's license in the state of Indiana for explosives. So um, I thought that was funny. Uh, uh, so I'll end with that, uh, wishing you a happy 4th of July, and we'll go with, with a bang. So, thank you. Okay. Welcome to Jordan. Oh, you should say that. I'll take some questions. I'm not an economic professor. Go ahead. Did anybody talk about depression houses? The question is, did anyone talk about depression houses, uh, special houses that were built during this time? No. But when I first got here and, and started in my career, I was a school social worker. 
and MCTSC had just started. I had a lot of whole visits out in the southern part of the county particularly where people were living in basements. And according to them, these were depression houses. They built the basements and then they ran out of money, so they just yes. put the roof over the top. And, and they were actually living in it with the hope of somebody adding the rest of the house. I, I think I have heard of those depression houses, but not in Monroe County. Um, so the idea is that the houses were built starting with the basement. basement, the funding ran out, and so they just completed what they could to put a, a lid on the house at a ground level. Right. So it must have been um, in the 70s that you were out, early 70s? Okay. In the early 70s. Yeah. So the Indiana Room at the Public Library was created in 1970. Um, and then in 1976 was our national bicentennial. And I think that really prompted a, a movement to preserve our architecture, our local histories, and do some historic preservation. And that is when um, the Indiana Room worked with some people to do recordings of these oral histories. And they were long, meandering conversations. Of course, when you sit down with somebody and you record a oral history, and they go down, they go off topic, you're just going to chase with them because you're so thankful for the gem of the story. So these, these were recorded um, in the 70s, so around the time. So um, I, I will look to see if there's anything, but I'm pretty sure the way that they got the information from these folks where they were working with people who were attached to the university, perhaps volunteers who could walk to the library to record. Um, and so they probably didn't get out to the county um, very, very easily. We have about 95 of these oral histories. Yes? Yeah. Bobby Taylor was the Indiana Room librarian at that time. And uh, uh, she did several audio recordings. And I, I did maybe five video recordings with her during that time. Uh, we should talk about getting this. Uh, we would love to digitize those oral histories, but the cassettes are a little brittle, so we're concerned about that. But I, I have been in touch with Bobby, so, she, so I do have a contact information with the librarian who started that project. So glad she did. Any more questions? Yes? That lady, Wilma Brinegar, did you, did you say what her exact address was on 2nd Street? Because that location you showed it's looked like, like, like it was practically where I grew up. Yeah, Mike, I knew that's where you grew up. That's where, uh, I, I knew that's where you grew up. That's why I included it. Um, but if you look at the 1913 Sanborn map, that parcel where she is is a pretty large parcel. And the hospital got built, what, 1908 or something like that? Yeah, further back. Further back. But, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a large parcel. I think it was a large garden. Would it be like a city director, do you think? Yeah, yeah, it would be in the city directory. And you look at the 1913 Sanborn map, that coal hill that you talk about is there, it's visible. Yeah, you had a question in blue? I knew Wilma real well. Oh. Um, she was a friend of mine. Last time I saw Wilma, she had to work in the Sanborn Museum. And then Wilma got married in 1914. And then Wilma got worse. Her family took her to Indianapolis, and that's where she passed away. Mike, she lived in the block. The same where it was the Colette's. Uh, Grandparents on Eucalyptus. Okay, it was within that same block on the same. She lived on top of the hill. Yes, she did. Oh, yes, and you could be in her house and work over to Hunter's School. She lived right across the street. And that's where she worked. Okay. And she was born there and raised there. So she was there. Wilma walked everywhere she went. Every day she walked to the library to read the newspaper. And she was a great lady, very classy lady. Oh, I know this isn't the subject, but uh, what do you think of the new library? I saw it in the paper today. Oh, you want to know what I think of the new library? <laughs> <laughs> well, is, is it going to have all the amenities that the downtown library does? Uh, I, it, I know it's not going to have the a local history area, but it, it, I think it's going to have a kitchen, a teaching yeah, kitchen, is which is really exciting. Um, what? Teaching kitchen? 
Oh, Lord, have a cook. Huh? Yeah. Is it going to have a microfilm machine? No, it's not going to have a microfilm machine, and no dead people are there, so I probably won't be assigned to work <laughs> over the bridge. It looks yeah. nice, though. Yeah, it looks very cool. Where is this new library? The new library will be um, by Bachelor Middle School at the, near the roundabout. Yeah. I'm curious. Um, Bloomington is exceptional compared to other Indiana cities because there is no history of the city in one ball. Why not? You, you wanted to know why the city doesn't have one volume of its history. So Monroe County has a history that was uh, compiled in 1884, I know, I know in 1914, like and then 1922, Pat Paul attached to the university, put a history out. And the History Center has family books and picture books, but a definitive history. I think there's a lot of energy that comes from the campus um, and, and excitement, you know, um, academic and um, people who have the, the, the energy to write. But I just don't think that format of a book is, is a desirable thing to them. Perhaps it's because they're only going to be in town for a little bit. Clay hasn't read the story yet. But is your answer to that is local history does not gain academic laurels. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. Bloomington is a history of two Bloomington. Yeah, I, I wonder. Well, not academic. So, do you think it's a town and gown thing, Clay? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Alive and well, you think? Oh, yeah. Yeah. completely. Yeah. Completely. Yes. So, maybe we should just start writing our own book, right? Yes. Um, I can tell you, I've been at the public library for 25 years, and local history is so fragmented. It's, it's scattershot. Uh, you know, you can find this on microfilm, you can find this in a newspaper clipping, you can find this in a file folder, and it's, um, it, it, it's, it's all over the place. Um, but most of us here already know that, so. and we're willing to do it, because it's it's, maybe it's the thrill of the pursuit. I don't, I don't know. Well, when we first started the History Club, I, me and uh, George and a lot of other people thought there wouldn't be enough material there. Ah. Enough people talking about different subjects about our history. We've run out of things. Yeah. Well, we've got almost 60 programs on YouTube. Yeah. And no end in sight. No, there's no so end in sight. Do. Because, you know, these local, these, these oral histories are about people's personal families. Somebody says, oh, we suffered greatly. The other one person says, oh, we did fine. Um, it's a, a personal a local history. I, I think one of the reasons we don't have a local history is that because the town is transient. I mean, I used to use that metaphor of a, a, a rushing creek or a brook that polishes the stones, and so all this great talent and energy comes to Bloomington and makes us really shiny, but then a lot of the talent and energy goes. Um, people do come here and they spend six six years here to attach to the university and, and then they, they go. Uh, or they go to Florida. You had a question? Yes, I did. Uh, not a question. Oh, a statement. Then you should come up. No, <laughs> so the, uh, some of the IU histories uh, dwell on a local history. I mean, they're offshoots. They're ma it's mainly about IU, but they're still uh, yeah. Since it's the place where Indiana University began, there are, there's some local history in those. If you were to read a biography on Herman B. Wells or um, Talia Farrow or... Well, um, yeah, but those that. histories always concentrate, center on Indiana University, not on the town. At the time, the university was uh, second to the town. Yeah. And later, this university became the tail that wagged the dog. Tail that wagged the, wagged the dog. That's right. And now, the, it's, it's the tail that became the dog. Yeah. No, that's true. The guy that had about four volumes of IU history, what was his name? I don't know. It was from the beginning. Yes. Uh, I don't remember. Well, anyway, uh, those are good. I mean, I perused them. And Banta, who lived here, also wrote them. A pretty good history, mm -hmm. Indiana University, and and the town. So, you know, at least you at least you got a little of that. Thank you very much. I enjoyed seeing your faces.